The Lord be with you. And also with you. Friends, welcome to worship on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning, a great Memorial Day weekend. I hope everyone is uh, enjoying this time. Uh, but we certainly want to always remember uh, those who have sacrificed so much on this uh, for this day uh, for our freedoms. Uh, so we certainly recall all those servicemen and women. Uh, I have a few announcements to lift up this morning. Uh, you'll see a whole bunch in our uh, bulletin, but the few I just want to pinpoint are a uh, youth group will meet tonight at 5 p.m. Uh, and a church office will be closed tomorrow in observance of uh, Memorial Day. Uh, I'll certainly have my email uh, where I'm available that way, but the office will be closed tomorrow. And Prayer Fellowship will meet this week, uh, this Wednesday, 9.30 in my study. If you would like to join us, uh, you're more than welcome. If you have any prayer requests, please uh, email them to me or, or make sure I jot them down and we'll make sure we uh, lift those up in prayer. Uh, are there any other announcements to draw attention to? Go ahead. Um, I have a lengthy list of items we need for the kitchen, cleaning products, paper products. Please see me after church if you can get one. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Martha? Uh, just a reminder about Bible school. Um, we will be having Bible school on June 10th through the 12th. And if you have neighbors or grandchildren or anything, I have some registration forms here. Uh, this is a community uh, Bible school event. It's at the First Baptist Church. Um, our church will be responsible for snacks the second two nights on the 11th and 12th. So I will be contacting some of you about helping with that. Um, I think we're pretty well covered as far as volunteers, but I can always use some more. So uh, anybody that you would love to help, we would love to have you. And like I said, if you know neighbors or anything that would be interested, please take some of these for you. Thank, Thank you, Martha. Mm -hmm. Any other announcements? I do. Piggybacking on Bible School Camp Peaks is coming up, and we do the snacks for for that, and meals for our staff sign up sheet on the board. Thank you. Just wanted to point out that the lyrics for today's anthem are in the bulletin. Um, it's a really beautiful piece, and the words are very meaningful. So, thank you. Any other announcements? All right. Seeing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Come, let us worship God. Our hymn is number 183. In you, Lord, I have put my trust.
slow to anger and steadfast in love. <coughs> Friends, forgiveness is ours through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
a document of your grace. For we pray in the name of Jesus, the Word made flesh. Amen. Today's Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, <coughs> and a mist was going up from the land, and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
announcement, she said that the words for the, the lyrics of that hymn are included in the bulletin. So please be sure to look over those if you didn't get the chance. <coughs> Our New Testament lesson this morning comes to us from the 12th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, verses 14 through 19. Listen now to the good news of Christ. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that will not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Friends, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing <coughs> and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, for some of you all are joining us for the first time. We're in the middle of a sermon series on the Apostles' Creed. It's something that we say every Sunday here, and we will repeat it again later in our service. Uh, but I wanted to take the time to go through and look at the different articles of this creed. And so today we've made it to the penultimate sermon in this series. Uh, last week we wrapped up the six articles in the creed concerning Jesus Christ. And we saw what it means to believe that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. Now today, we will transition in the creed to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. These remaining six articles are short, so we'll take a look at the first three together and see what it means to believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. In modern Presbyterian circles, the Holy Ghost is often the least explained and least explored of the three persons of the Trinity. Now, for my Pentecostal background, that was the opposite. The Holy Ghost was often lifted up to a level above the Father or the Son. Now, truth be told, I have witnessed the power of the Holy Spirit. From charismatic dancing to speaking in tongues, those things neither shock me nor astound me, for they were commonplace in my home church. But then I moved to the other end of the spectrum, where Presbyterians are <laughs> lovingly, <laughs> not so lovingly, <laughs> described as the frozen <laughs> I, uh, I like to joke that the Holy Spirit does indeed move Presbyterians. He, he moves us to sit down. <laughs> Truthfully, the way we interact with the Holy Ghost is not as important as the reality of the Holy Ghost. Whether or not the Spirit moves you into a charismatic jig is not as important as the fact that the Spirit is real and is indeed moving through us. Now, I've mentioned this before. The word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the Holy Bible. And though this word is a theological fabrication, it nevertheless expresses scriptural truth. Now, we see the Holy Spirit manifesting himself throughout both the Old and New Testaments. John read for us one of the earliest recordings of the Spirit. Although the, Spirit, the, the Spirit's debut is actually in verse 2 of Genesis 1. So after we hear of God's Spirit hovering over the waters at creation, we see the Spirit involved in the creation of Adam. After 
forming the man out of the dust of the earth, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now this animating force was done through the Holy Spirit. And we see this again in the New Testament where Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The Holy Spirit is a life force of not only natural man, but of regenerate man as well. So not only is creation an important work of the Spirit, but so is regeneration. Now, regeneration is an act done by God on behalf of the believer. And in the New Testament context, the Holy Ghost's first work is regeneration. Now, I know I've mentioned this before, but regeneration is also known as born again or quickening. In regeneration, God's Spirit causes a person to be reborn according to the Spirit. Remember what Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Before regeneration, an individual is a child of the flesh. And in biblical terms, things of the flesh are naturally sinful and in opposition to the things of the Spirit. After regeneration, the Spirit aligns our wills with God's will. Meaning our disposition changes from that of desiring sin to desiring God. This new alignment with God is what gives us new life, or quickening, to use an old term. When we speak of regeneration, we are talking about dying to the old way of living under sin and under condemnation, and being born anew into a life under obedience and under grace. This transformational activity is another work of the Spirit known as sanctification. Sanctification, too, goes by other names, including holiness and mortification. Once regeneration occurs and a new life in Christ is established, the Holy Spirit then aids and counsels us in the process of maturing our faith. Like a good wine or a good cheese, a maturing process is needed before one can reach the a final robust state of unity with God. But so long as we are on this planet still living in our sinful bodies, we are in constant need of sanctification. And the Spirit sanctifies us according to God's command. Now, I know I've definitely said this before, but our sanctification is not something we can complete on our own, nor is it something completed in this lifetime. You see, another way of describing this is holiness. Christ calls us to be holy and perfect, just as his Father in heaven is perfect. But there's no way that we can ever be perfect like God, at least not in this life. But that does not mean we are not to try. One downfall of the Reformed faith comes in the form of hyper-Calvinism. These are Calvinists who believe no work is necessary from the elect. For God does it all, and any reprobate is such by God's will, and therefore no reproof is necessary against their sin. Now that's a false understanding of Calvinism, and a viewpoint that is not scriptural. Though it is the Spirit who is the first mover, the born-again Christian has a responsibility to mortification of the flesh. Now this is another theological phrase, but it comes to us from Paul. He teaches that the regenerate Christian must put to death the old way and the old self, thus mortifying the flesh. We are still responsible for resisting temptation and obedience to God's commands. The Christian, and even the Calvinist, is still responsible for going into the world, making disciples for Christ, baptizing the nations, and teaching obedience to Jesus' commands. All of this 
is possible only by and through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, this is what it means to believe in the Holy Ghost. Now, at this point in the creed, we come to another challenging article. What does it mean to believe in the Holy Catholic Church? Now, I have to share this story that I shared at the beginning of this series. At my last church I served, there was an older gentleman there, I mean, in his 90s, who was raised Baptist, probably a Baptist for a large portion of his life, but for some reason was drawn to the Presbyterian Church. <coughs> Well, his oldest son is still Baptist, and one day his son was visiting him, and of course, as we do in all Presbyterian circles on Sunday morning, we uh, affirmed our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Now, I happened to be looking at this man's son as he read the phrase, Holy Catholic Church. Now, as he did, I saw him simultaneously double-take and rebound in, in dismay. <laughs> Now, granted, before I became a Presbyterian, I too was raised in a church that was very anti-Roman Catholic. So to say that you believe in the Holy Catholic Church is not only a shock for some people, but could be outright offensive. But once you ever understand the language, it begins to make more sense. The word Catholic is an old Latin word for universal. So when we affirm our faith with the creed, we are not swearing allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church. Rather, we are affirming the universality of the body of Christ. The difference is usually visible in writing. When you see the word Catholic with a capital C, that is referencing the Roman Catholic Church. But when you see Catholic with a lowercase c, that denotes the church universal. So what then does it mean to confess the church is universal? Does it mean every single person on this planet Earth is a regenerate Christian? Well, not according to my Bible. When we speak of the universal church, we are speaking of both the visible and the invisible church. Now, the visible church is us. You and me, all of those who are gathered this morning in fellowship and in worship, the visible church is made up of flesh and blood and brick and mortar. It is a tangible to us. It is knowable to us. It is visible to us. We can see it. The invisible church is known only to God. It includes all born-again Christians from across time. While the visible church is limited to living beings, the invisible church consists of both the living and the dead. Furthermore, the invisible church consists strictly of those who are truly regenerate Christians, whom God bestows his effectual call. There are no sinners in the invisible church. The visible church, however, can and often does contain members who are not born again according to the Spirit. The visible church may have as members uh, those who are still children of wrath and sowers of iniquity. Now, this is not so with the invisible church. The invisible church is made up of only God's elect. Now, this is a completely scriptural concept and comes to us from the lips of Jesus himself. In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, our Lord says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? And I, I will declare to them, says the Lord, I never do. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus admits that there will be some who claim to prophesy to exercise, to testify in his name. People who claim to have faith, who use all the right words, but are false teachers and lovers of discord. They're not actually his sheep, but workers of lawlessness. 
Now, these are sobering words from our Savior himself. These words are hard to swallow, but they're right here. Thankfully, Jesus gives us a way of knowing whether we are his sheep or workers of lawlessness. Those who will enter the kingdom of heaven are they who do the will of the Father. And my friends, the Father's will is revealed to us in his word. It's not unknown to us. It's not foreign to us. It's right here. It's in the pew in front of you, or on your nightstand, or on your bookshelf. If you want to know the Father's will and our responsibility as regenerate beings, then turn to the Bible, and the Spirit shall make it. Now, to confess the Holy Catholic Church is to believe in the universal nature of the body of Christ, both physically and spiritually. It is physically universal in that the church is not localized to a particular country or ethnic group. Now, this was not the case before Pentecost, when only the Israelites and their descendants, they were considered the children of God. But now that designation is open to both Jew and Gentile. And to confess the Holy Catholic Church is also to believe in the spiritually universal nature of the body of Christ, consisting of God's adopted sons and daughters from across time and across space, and consisting of a pure and unmingled faith. But this is important. That invisible church will not be realized and made known to us until the end times. For now, we are to find our comfort in the visible church and in the communion of saints. To understand the communion of saints, I'd like to draw upon question 55 of the Heidelberg Catechism. The answer there says, first, that all and everyone who believes being members of Christ, are in common, partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. And secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty, readily and cheerfully, to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. The Catechism distinguishes two aspects that are both present when we confess the communion of saints. The first echoes what we read from this morning from 1 Corinthians. Verse 14, chapter 12 says, The body does not consist of one member, but of many. All and everyone who believes are members of Christ. Scripture is telling us that one cannot be a Christian in isolation. We need community. We need relationships. And the saints of God especially need communion. Now, there's a growing trend in the world of people claiming to be spiritual but not religious and thinking it's okay. They say things like, I believe in God, I just don't go to church. Or I read the Bible and pray every day, I just don't like hanging out with Christians. I don't know what Bible they may be reading, but the one I have heard says that the body of Christ does not consist of one member, but of many. Being a Christian is not a solo, go-it-alone venture. A person who believes in God, reads the Bible, and prays every day knows she needs community. A community of believers. What I think is that the folks who say those types of things, I believe they were hurt by the church or are fearful of a particular church person. 99% of the time, that's the underlying catalyst for spiritual, not religious. And that's our fault as a church for not teaching and loving properly. And that leads me nicely into the second aspect of the communion of saints that both Paul and the Heidelberg Catechism posit. Everyone must know it to be his duty, readily and cheerfully, to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. 
Or, I love it the way the apostle so eloquently puts it, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? Each of us has a gift from God. Each of us has many gifts from God. And we are all responsible for employing these gifts for both the betterment of the church and in bearing witness to the world. This is a double-edged responsibility. The Christian is to use her God-given gifts in both the ecclesial world and in the secular world. In the secular world, this responsibility manifests in things like vocation, evangelism, and philanthropy. In the ecclesial world, in the church world, this responsibility looks like shepherding, interceding, building up the body of Christ. Now, I could go on on a whole other sermon there, but for now, I just want to say we're going to pay witness to this later in our service when we will install our elders for the year. Eldership is an important responsibility within the communion of saints. When we install these elders, I'm going to ask you to do two things. First, think of ways you can support these elders in their ministry. These folks do a lot for the church, for this community, for their families. Pray for them and support them as brothers and sisters in the faith. And second, consider your role in this communion of saints. You have gifts from God. Whether you're new to church, were born in it, or have been or are coming back from a long wayward path, whether you're still in grade school well into retirement or nearing a midlife crisis, God is not done with you yet. I implore you to prayerfully consider your gifts and your role within this beautiful and complex body of Christ. Let us pray. Wonderful Counselor, Holy Spirit, we ask that you move amongst us today as you did at creation and at Pentecost. Speak to us that we may have faith, unity, and industry. O Holy Ghost, you are the giver of our faith, and we pray for an unwavering faith grounded in Scripture that manifests in all aspects of life. We pray for a unity according to your word that tears down dividing walls of hostility and opens the heart to community. And we pray for an industrious nature that moves us to serve your church, the body of Christ, and the world around us, bearing testimony to the gospel of peace, hope, and love. In the name of the eternally begotten Son, hear our prayers. Amen. <laughs> and now, friends, in response to God's word, I ask that you stand and sing hymn number 443, O Christ, the Great Foundation. <laughs>
We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. Now this is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our Lord <coughs> within the community of the church. Some are called to particular services as deacons, as elders, as ministers of the word and sacrament. Now, ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of compassion and evangelism in the world, ordering the governance of the church and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of Alphabet to Presbyterian Church now installs Kevin D. Bernard, Carolyn Lees, and Jack Ritzer to the office of ruling elder. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks for in countless ways you reveal yourself and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the flood, your wrath was kindled against iniquity. And your grace was bestowed upon the faithful. And you delivered Noah and his family into a renewed covenant with you. We praise you that through the waters of the sea, you led your people Israel out of bondage into the land you promised, a land flowing with milk and honey. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. For the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and gave us, gave us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you that in baptism you give us your Holy Spirit, who teaches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations and serve you as a royal priesthood. We rejoice that you claimed us in our baptism and that by your grace we are born in you. By your Holy Spirit, renew us that we may be empowered to do your will continue forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. Elders, I have some questions for you. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's holy word? Do you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God, do you and will you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? I will. Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Do we, the members of the church, accept Kevin, Carolyn, and Jack as elders, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we? We do. Do we agree to encourage them 
to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church. Do we? We, we do. do. Then let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you all thanks and praise, for you are faithful to your covenant people, whom you have called out of bondage and redeemed to be your own. In every time and place you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation. We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who follow without fear, placing their trust in you alone. We give you thanks for judges and kings who ruled in righteousness and peace. We praise you for prophets and apostles who spoke your words of truth and obedience. We thank you for men and women in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love <coughs> in all that he said and did. Pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain this congregation in ministry. Ground us in the gospel. Secure our hope in Christ. Strengthen our service to the outcasts and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together, that we may be servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Kevin, Carol, Jack, you are now installed elders in the Church of Jesus Christ, and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. As Paul says to Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And now, friends, let us all stand and confess our faith, the one faith of the church universal, with these words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we must strive to mold our lives according to God's grace. We bring our gifts this day as a sign that we worship not what we hoard in our pockets, but the one who is revealed in the act of self-giving. Let us offer our lives in joy.
God, as we bring these offerings, we pray that our joy in the act of giving might draw others to your table. Use these gifts. Have your way with us. For we seek to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now we enter into a time of prayer for our families, our friends, our communities, and loved ones. You see the prayer requests that are printed in the bulletins. And we have a few others to lift up this morning. Like I said earlier, let's uh, as we enjoy this extended weekend, uh, please keep in your thoughts and your prayers all those who sacrificed so much and for whom this Memorial Day was established, all those who died in service of this nation and protection of her citizens. Uh, Darlene Robertson would like us to keep Lynn Copes in your prayers. She uh, fell, but nothing uh, too serious. Just would like us to keep her in our prayers. Are there any others? Yes. Ethan Kidd is undergoing brain surgery today at UVA. Mm -hmm. That's a relative of ours. Ethan Kidd is having brain surgery. We'll keep him in our prayers. Thank you. Yes, Stephanie. Joyce and Ron, and also um, Mike Revis. Uh, he's a co worker of mine, and his mom just died last night. So, so your work co worker, Mike Revis, and his family, the loss of his mother, and of course the Coleman's. Let's keep them in our prayers as well. Okay. Lois Whitehurst, her husband was Reverend William Whitehurst. She died yesterday. Sure. So the family of Lois Whitehurst, Whitehurst. We'll keep them in our prayers. Thank you. Mark. I like to lift up my mom, Linda. She's got some tests this week and feeling a little anxious about all that. So sure. we'll we certainly lift her up. Keep Linda in our prayers. I know there's a lot of transition going on in her life, so we'll certainly uh, lift her up. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mark. Uh, Trisha Garner, my boss's wife, who is going through cancer treatment. Trisha Garner, going through cancer. Thank you. Any others? Yes, sir. Joy, the McCrickers are joining us this morning. Uh, yes, yes, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And again, also, I know uh, Martha has her uh, kids and grandkids joining us. Welcome. Yes. Thank you all. So good that you all could be here. Any others? Seeing none, let us bring our prayers to the Lord. Gracious God, your electing love made the faithful yours before we ever drew breath, and still we will be yours when the pulse of life ceases. In every fragile, broken, and renewed moment, we belong to you. We marvel at the ways that you reveal your love and your care. You bless us with bonds of kinship, with saints in our midst, and with the faithful of every time and place. And so we thank you for brothers and sisters who light the way for us, who speak the truth in love, who continue to hope even when we give them little reason to do so. Holy God, may our gratitude for your steady presence make us quick to welcome, to forgive, and to share your good news of salvation. We pray for those who are losing hope because of joblessness, loneliness, persistent pain, or powerful addiction. We pray for those who cannot rest and those who cannot heal. Abolish war from the land. Make your children lie down in safety. Merciful God, we pray that you would widen the circles of our concern. Your ways are not our ways, and this world is not our true home. Grant us the courage to be faithful witnesses to a world so set on turning away from you. We pray for your children who are persecuted by powers beyond their control. We pray for your servants struggling to share your word in the most hostile regions of the world. We long for the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. Redeeming God, stake your claim on us now until we hear your gospel echoed in the corner of the world and see your image shining from the multitude of your chosen. For we pray in the name of Jesus who regenerates our lives for the sake of your love. And now we are bold to pray as Christ taught us, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, in response to God's word and grace, I invite you to stand and sing hymn number 2212 in the thin supplemental hymn, My Life Flows On. Thank you. 